Welcome back. The question we're investigating is whether the argument that Thomas Nagel gives in What Is It Like to Be a Bat is valid and sound. Remember, a valid argument is one where the conclusion must be true if the premises are true. A sound argument is a valid argument in which all the premises are in fact true. For each premise in Nagel's argument, we can ask, why should we think it's true? That is, we can seek reasons to justify our belief or disbelief. Some premises may be obviously true, commonly agreed to be true, or stipulated for the sake of discussion. Others might be supported by arguments of their very own. Nagel's first premise says that a correct scientific theory of consciousness must explain its phenomenological features, its subjective character. There's a way of understanding this claim that makes it obviously true. Any explanation of consciousness must explain consciousness. But Nagel's claim is a bit more subtle. The kind of theory that concerns him is one that is objective in his sense of not involving points of view. So the claim is that any objective explanation of consciousness must explain its subjective character. And Nagel thinks that this is something that anyone who's trying to give a scientific account of consciousness is already committed to. He thinks this is just what it is to adopt a physicalist approach to consciousness. Let's permit Nagel to assume that premise one is commonly agreed to be true among philosophers and scientists. But at the same time, notice that almost every term in this premise is open to interpretation. Scientific theory or account, physicalism, consciousness, subjective character, and perhaps most importantly for this case, explanation. All of these ideas can be contentious. The next two premises make claims about consciousness and science. One is that consciousness is essentially tied to a point of view. Why believe that? Well, that's the premise that Nagel's trying to support by asking us to think about what it's like to be a bat. We'll come back to that in a moment. The other supporting premise claims that scientific explanation inevitably abandons points of view. Nagel seems to think that this is an obvious or widely accepted feature of scientific explanation. So he doesn't say much about it in this paper, but I think we can question this premise. On the one hand, we could point to explanations like those based on Einstein's special theory of relativity and argue that they represent examples where scientific explanation does not abandon points of view. In fact, you could argue that special theory of relativity is an explanatory framework that explains points of view, specifically the different points of view on events that make it tricky to find answers to questions about which events occur simultaneously, that is, the relativity of simultaneity. That would be to argue that premise three is false. On the other hand, we could argue that the kind of explanation that physicalist or scientific approaches require need not be objective in the special way that Nagel thinks is impossible. Or, to put it another way, we might say that the kinds of explanation that abandon points of view are not the only kinds that physicalist or scientific theories can deploy. This would be to argue that Nagel's argument equivocates on the notion of explanation, that explanation is not the same in premise one and premise three. Or we might think, if we hold the notion of explanation fixed, premise one and premise three can't be true at the same time. This would be to argue that Nagel's argument is unsound because it's either invalid, that is, it depends on an equivocation, or because it contains at least one false premise if one and three can't be true at the very same time. But for the sake of argument, let's assume that there's no equivocation, so the argument is valid. And let's assume there's an interpretation that makes both premises one and three plausibly true. If so, then the weight of the argument falls on premise two, the claim about the subjective nature of conscious experience. Is it true? As noted, the bulk of Nagel's article is dedicated to giving reasons to believe that consciousness is subjective in this special way. If that's the argument for the essential subjectivity of consciousness and its inaccessibility to objective explanation, then what is the argument against that view? One alternative is presented by Kathleen Aikens in her paper, What Is It Like to Be Boring and Myopic? Although you might have thought her title is a burn on Nagel, she's actually describing what she thinks about the experience of bats. Their lives are highly routinized and repetitive, hence boring, and their eyesight is good, but only at close distances, hence myopic or short-sighted, like me. Aikens doesn't rely on asking us to imagine what it's like to be a bat. 
Instead, she dives into the scientific literature on bats, bats' lives, bat echolocation, bat vision, bat hunting insects, bat brains, and so on. She argues that insofar as there's anything at all that it's like to be a bat, we can actually know quite a bit about what it's like. The strategy she describes and demonstrates is to bring together information about the physics of light and sounds, the ecological niche and survival needs of creatures like bats, details about bats' behavioral repertoire, and the informational demands that bats have as it relates to hunting. She also includes information about bat perceptual and motor physiology. Aikens argues that once you see how bats actually do what they do against the background of their environments and the constraints of physics, and you compare that to the experiences and behaviors of other creatures, not least of which ourselves, we can have excellent reasons to think that we can know quite a lot about what it's like to be a bat. What do you think? We've started the class by talking about Nagel and Aikens in order to get a familiar and contemporary sense of the mind-body problem and how it can be seen as arising from reflection on ordinary experiences that we all have. But of course, the problem didn't just pop into philosophy with Nagel in 1974, nor even with the advent of scientific psychology around 1895. For the next two weeks, we're going to look at some historical ways of thinking about minds and bodies and use them to flesh out the contemporary version of the mind-body problem before we start looking at proposed solutions. Before you go on to the next week of lessons, be sure to take the short quiz. This quiz focuses on the concepts of validity and soundness. I'm going to ask you to master those concepts and apply them throughout the semester, so they're definitely ideas you want to fully understand rather than just temporarily memorize and forget about after the quiz.